You are listening to the Backstage Pass podcast, hosted by Hannah Trigwell and brought to you by Toman. Hello, Will Dewsbury. We've known each other for a number of years and to give a quick introduction to the viewers and the listeners of Backstage Pass podcast, you are, as I best know you, a session musician, touring musician, and more recently, a scientist, but we'll get into that a bit later on. But if we go back to when you first started being a session player, yeah, how did you yeah. get into that? I was at Leeds College of Music, um, and at the time I was involved in a lot of different bands, um, recording in a lot of different places. Um, and actually, we first met exactly through that sort of um, intermingling of circles. Yeah. Um, and so really, it was, a, it was sort of fortune that I happened to um, be in those sort of circles and, and got those first jobs with you. And then from there, when you're touring and when you're around, you meet other people, mm. you meet different artists. Um, and fr- from that sort of point of view, you then um, take on additional work. Um, so that was a really good sort of um, intro that I had into uh, doing that sort of thing for, for a living, for a career. Yeah. Uh, and actually, um, most of that, for me at least, was, as I say, fortune. And I, I've had this sort of... I suppose you could call it a bad habit or personality trait of being quite passive generally. <laughs> and I, I don't necessarily seek opportunities perhaps in, right. the, in the way that would be a really good sort of idea for people to do. And so I was just just very lucky baby, basically to be able to um, make those contacts initially. I think um, and so, being a very skilled player, you you almost didn't need to try as hard to seek the opportunities because I think you were quite in demand I know you're a very humble person, but you, <laughs> Will is a cringe in my <laughs> yeah. Will is I'm a so very <laughs> Will is a very skilled guitarist, and I remember because I was looking for a guitarist, wasn't I? This is years ago. Yeah, this is like this is ten, a long time ago. Is it like ten years ago? It's probably if yeah, around that around that sort of figure between eight to ten years, I'd say. And I was working with a, yeah. a producer and, and I said, do you know any guitarists? And he said, there is this one guitarist, but he's really busy. He's in loads of different bands. Um, so I was under the impression that you wouldn't be able to do it, but you were like, yeah, let's just do it. <laughs> and then and then I remember meeting you and being like, so how many things have you got going on? Trying to see if you had capacity to do any, do like some session stuff for me and like touring. Um, and you were like, well, I'm in I'm in these like four function bands and I'm, I'm doing these <laughs> like three other projects. And then I've got this other project. And I was like, wow, like to sit to, as someone who's passive and not looking for opportunity. It was you were very busy, very busy guy. We did a lot of stuff in terms of um, some early videos, in terms of the YouTube type stuff that you did initially, some of the cover versions, and eventually moving in through to some of the original material. I had a really great time sort of working on that alongside you. And then... Um, obviously, met, come um, on. Yes, obviously, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then and then through that, um, we both met actually a really nice guy called Nick Howard yeah. who uh, was, was touring... Um, with us on, on several tours both here and, and over in, in Europe as well. He was the winner of um, the voice in Germany, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um really lovely guy, mm. really, really positive attitude, really, you know, actually really I know it sounds really cheesy, but quite an inspiring Yeah, absolutely. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, quite an inspiring human being. And um and obviously very good at what he did. And then I had the opportunity then to go on a few um sort of adventures around Europe with Nick doing some touring there. Yeah. And that was mostly live work. Um, we actually did a, a live album for that. Um, I forget what it's called, but it's it's really good. Worth checking out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so yeah, so and then from from there, I sort of basically really just stayed with with you guys as a I don't know how you define it really. It's not really a permanent fixture as such, but like a, an ongoing session role, if that makes sense. Mm. Rather than um, doing a lot of different things with a lot of different people. Yeah. Um, it was it was fairly focused at that stage. Um, and yeah, so, and obviously we met, well, I met Ben, um, I think you've had on the, the show previously. Yes. Um, so Ben Matravers, uh, the producer. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so I ended up doing some stuff within, uh, the studio, his studio yeah. with him. And that's most of the studio work that I've done. So most of the things I've done session wise have been live based. Mm. And so it's been, it was really good to get some, some experience within a, a studio setting as well. What do you prefer? Um, because I'm. 
a perfectionist and I really struggle with letting things go. So in the studio, you're under the microscope mm. and you notice every little tiny thing that perhaps other people won't notice, yeah. perhaps they will. And I just cannot let that go. I know rationally <laughs> that I should. Yeah. <laughs> but I just can't. Yeah. And so I love I love the end end result, the end products of, of studio work. Um but I have to say live work, there's something there's something to the energy of the, the audience and, mm. and the, the fact that it's it's there and then it's gone and it's done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah there's something about that that I think I, you get really more really closure like. almost, don't you, sometimes from that. Yeah, yeah. Unless you do a live album, in which case <laughs> you actually can hear it back for all time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and for the studio stuff and the live stuff i've seen you use the same um kind of kit set up a few times yeah yeah tell us about that yeah so yeah i did have a, a gigantic pedal board and maybe used about three of those pedals as every <laughs> guitarist knows you probably go through that phase at some point um and basically i transitioned away from that and towards um, a unit called the axe effects which at the time i think was I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was fairly, fairly new. Yeah, um, it was. And basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and basically it, it allowed a lot of flexibility and in terms of being able to create sound, store sounds. And um, I would say have them at your fingertips. So it's not really at your fingertips, the, the tips of your toes, I suppose, <laughs> when you're uh, tapping on the pedals. And, um, and yeah, and you could create some really, really interesting sounds. And the quality of those sounds was such that you really in a live setting especially it was really tough to tell the difference and it mm. removed the some of the variability in terms of um because at one stage i forget the amp i had i think it was a, a mesa stiletto which was great yeah when you had the settings just perfect but it seemed to be like really variable in, in different venues mm. and this this unit really got rid of all that and it was just it's going to be the same every single time and it's going to sound great um and usually it did yeah. So yeah, and then I've I've never really looked back with that, and also it's a lot smaller and easy to carry around. Yeah. So from a laziness point of view, that's also <laughs> yeah. a good thing. Do you have any other tips for people who want to be session musicians, aside from like being in the right circles? Should we do a top three? Yeah, yeah. Let's do a top, top three. three. Right, I've got to think of three things. No, so the the first one I would say is being um, proactive with generating leads and generating jobs. Uh, so actually. Yes, I know I mentioned about being in the right environment, but actually trying to put yourself in the environment if you're not in it mm. or maximize on actually speaking to people and networking if you already happen to be in that. And then the second one relates to that. So I would see that as a kind of binary pass fail. Did I get the job or did I not get the job? Mm. I got it, great, I didn't, bad. If I'd looked at it a little bit more developmentally, I think I'd have had a bit more success with it. So for example, I would play hours and hours of guitar every single day. And if I couldn't do something, that was fine. That was okay because I knew that in a period of weeks I would develop the skill set or months, depending on what it was, and I'd get there. And I think having that sort of attitude and outlook towards actually generating work and generating jobs is, it would be a healthy thing to do. Yeah. So you not only are you saying, did I get the job or did I not get the job? You're evaluating and reflecting, how well did that go? What things could I improve on? Mm -hmm. And so you're getting better at the skill of networking and the skill of, um, lead generation right so that would be sort of one and two um which is kind of one but i'm going to call it one and two because then i don't have to think of one more um the third <laughs> one yeah would be looking after your general health okay so you've got to be in the game for a, a long period of time to have mm. success okay and there's a there's a little acronym or a little mnemonic you can think of which is snaps and snaps stands for sleep nutrition alcohol intake physical activity um, stress and smoking and you could put these on a bit of a scale, okay, or a bit of a, a seesaw. And some of these factors are going to lead to improved recovery and some of them are going to lead to um, decreased recovery. Mm. Whatever it is that you're doing, whether that's practice, um, physical training, whatever, that always has to pass through the gate of recovery. So if you don't have those factors in check, whatever you're doing is going to be less optimal than it could be. Yeah. So I think to sum it up, be proactive see that as a developmental thing and take care of your general health to maximize those two. I would say if I had to sort of be brief about it, yeah. um, which I'm not very good at doing, that would be <laughs> that would be my sort of top three tips, let's say. The, basically, the question that we're looking to answer is, can music be a form of physiotherapy? Just by listening. And it's a, so this is where the definitions are going to come in. So okay. there's basically broadly two pathways. So there's 
music is what's called adjunctive therapy. So an, an adjunctive therapy is something that you would add to the mainstay of whatever it is you're doing. So let's say you're doing an exercise program. Traditionally in physio, you might also do some ice. You might also do some heat. The ice and the heat, although there's questions about how effective those things are, are adjunctive to the exercise. So music can function like that. Yeah. So music listening could potentially be part of that. And then the other side of it is music is direct therapy. So that exercise regime we just talked about, the, a music um, sort of a, a therapy constructed from musical means could replace either part or all of that in, uh, intervention. So by way of example, if you have an individual with low back pain, that exercise regime could be partially replaced by placing drums at different heights and having them hit the drums in order to externally cue and create the movement that you're after um, that you've decided is going to be beneficial for that particular individual. And so that's a direct therapy. Right. So we have these two sort of broad streams. Um, and so the interesting thing about it all is it sits into this nice little schema um, where we have, so if you imagine like a triangle, and we have a, a task, so whatever that happens to be that someone's trying to achieve, uh, which takes place in an environment and it's carried out by an individual. So the environment can have a, a large effect on your motor output, so the way that your muscles and nerves work, mm. for example. You know this if you've ever like walked or run on sand, there's a reflexive change in how you actually um, yeah. move and how you operate. So, so music as adjunct fits quite nicely into that. So it's a part of the sound environment, you could say. Okay. So the sound environment can affect it that way. And then music as direct therapy feeds into the task component of that. And then, sorry to bore you, but the very last thing in terms it's of not... having a bit of a... <laughs> it's not boring. <laughs> I know, I've just chatted and chatted and chatted, <laughs> no, so good. please feel no, free to No, it's good, me. come on. Um, and then the other thing to take into consideration is that music can be full pieces of music or it can be musical elements specifically that you're using, so things like rhythmicity, um, amplitude, even just qualities oh, okay. of sound, so yeah, frequency, amplitude, timbre, envelope, all these things... Mm can be used to produce um, different effects, mainly within the brain and the neurological system, yeah. um, which can then sort of change how a person moves or um, can potentially help in their rehabilitation. So that's a sort of potted overview oh, okay. of some of the direct directions that we're taking with it. Right. I mean, this it sounds like something that could really have a lot of application. Yeah, well, and if you look at the literature, a lot of it already has been um, studied in specific populations. Okay. Um, so there's a there's a, a modality called uh, neurologic music therapy, and some of these things have been used, for example, in um, a Parkinson's patient cohort, um, where some of these patients have difficulty um, with rhythmicity, with their walking gait, yeah. stride length, things like that. And when you add external pacing to that, so like a metronome or even potentially a piece of music, you can actually do things over time, like. Um, improve their their gait parameters and this has been looked wow. at um already so um and there's variance in the literature obviously yeah. as there always is with these things so our, our sort of task or my task is to try and draw this together into a bit of a an overarching theory as to in the different areas of physio how how we could apply um music and elements of music and so yeah i find it quite interesting and exciting yeah. and um we're looking forward to to see where seeing um seeing where it goes actually it's hard, isn't it? Because music's so subjective. So I guess if you play one yeah, kind of music yeah. that you think would be relaxing to someone, it might not be. It might not someone evoke else, that yeah. in someone. Yeah. That, that's why I suppose why the, some of those musical elements are quite useful because they tend to be a bit more universal. So ryth right. rhythmicity, something like that, you know, tempo, those kind of things. Yeah. Although even then, there's some differences socioculturally in terms of beat perception as well. So yeah. it's kind of. Yeah, there will be some variation and that produces some really weird and wonderful findings mm. about, you know, listening to certain pieces of music affecting, you know, the immune system in a certain way. And yeah. it's like, it's really difficult. The hard thing about that is if, you know, if it's a single study, it's really difficult to, to sort of um, pay a lot of attention or take those results really seriously, even though they did occur. Yeah. Because like you say, it could be partly based on preference of, of listener or almost all based on preference of listener. Is, yeah, is true. The, what is your track of the week? Mm, I'm I'm really liking um, generally not particular track, but um, Olafur Arnells. If you've heard of that, uh, Olafur Arnells, he's an Icelandic composer. No, I haven't um, actually. And um, lots of really beautiful sort of classical um, 
almost like ambient landscape type pieces. What is the best lesson that you've learned in your career so far? Always be personable, always make good relationships. I would say it's probably the best lesson that I've learned, which is that, and that will take you a long way, assuming that you're good enough to be there in the first place. Mm. It's just really interesting to hear about your research into music as physio and and I am going to Google it later. But yeah, really nice to talk to you and I hope you have a great day. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Be sure to hit subscribe and leave a comment to let us know what you think. And I will see you next time on Backstage Pass.